Hi, everyone. Welcome to Farsight's Molecular Machines Group. Really excited to have Ban Hong here today. Thank you so much for joining us. I think it's your first time presenting to our Molecular Machines Group. Hopefully, it's not the last time. Today, you'll be presenting on programmable nucleic acid tools to visualize and regulate gene expression. Thanks a ton for joining. We're really happy to have you here. I'll be in the chat monitoring questions. I'll also share more info about you in the chat here. And with that being said, please take it away. Okay, uh, thanks to Asim for the introduction. And uh, really nice to be here because uh, I think uh, I've been very uh, familiar with the audience, some of the people already. And I think uh, my work uh, also can make a face this kind of like a molecular machine. Uh, I can just briefly introduce myself. My, my name is Fan Hong. Currently, I'm a certain professor in the University of Florida Department of Chemistry. Actually, I just started my lab from last August. So before that, I did my uh, postdoc at a Pongis group working basically on DNA advanced uh, bioimaging for tissue uh, analysis. And before that, I did my PhD with ASU with Dr. Hao Yan on uh, DNA origami, DNA structure biology, uh, sorry, DNA, DNA structures. And also, also work with Dr. Addison Green to design some RNA molecular machines to regulate gene expression. And also briefly with Peter Sock on the, the computational part, software package to analyze the nucleic acid folding in, in cellular systems. So the topic today I'm going to talk about is the programmable nucleic acids to visualize and uh, regulate the gene expression. As you know that the, the biologic system is a, a complex system. So it consists of lots of uh, uh, biomolecules. And uh, those these biomolecules basically self-assemble uh, like uh, to form a different kind of like architectures uh, inside uh, like uh, cells. And also in, within the cells, there are also some like uh, organelles and membranous organelles that are to uh, host a kind of like a spatial organizations, uh, scaffolds for different kind of complicated reactions to happen. And uh, another layer of, of the complexity is that biological systems is not just static uh, structures, right? There are so many different uh, biochemical reactions happened and uh, all of these biochemical reactions connecting with each other to form a very complex uh, reaction networks. For my like a view for the biologic system is that it's a spatial structure assisted molecular information flow systems. There are two parts. The first one is the structure of the biological systems and the, the molecules have organized uh, to form those different uh, um, structures. And the, the second one is the uh, uh, information flow, the, the chemicals, you know, connecting with each other through different uh, chemical reaction networks. So to access those chemical information, there are different like uh, uh, perspective. The first one is the species. There are so many different types of molecules inside of the cells. And second one is the quantities. They, they have different, you know, concentrations that you apply different like a, a weight in the chemical reactions. And the spatial distributions, I know that uh, the cell uh, and the tissue, they're not uh, just uh, randomly, uh, you know, floating around. They have a particular uh, kind of like a preferred location within our cells, uh, within our tissue. So the spatial uh, location also are very important. And the final one is also the uh, connectivity uh, within the like, chemical molecules and then on another scale within the, within the cells, between the cells. And then also the final one, the, the, all these molecules, they're not a, just a state of state, constant relationship, constant concentrations or the, uh, the locations. Actually, they will come like a change or, or according to the time or the evolution of the cells. For, I think they have two questions that really trying to answer like a bigger question, higher level question is how can we access those massive information to really understand the bio biologic systems? And the second question is that how can we after we got some information for these biologic systems, and how can we kind of interact with these biologic systems by designing functional biomolecules to put inside the biologic systems to interact with this, to play with the, the spatial organizations or regulate the, the dynamic uh, reaction, like reaction networks. So that's kind of like two questions I'm trying to answer in higher level. And then to answer that question, we need a kind of a starting point. And my currently we're like more focusing on the RNA and compared with the DNA. Initially, I was primarily work on DNA, but when you move to the biologic systems, and the RNA have a, a, a the better molecules to start with because one RNA has a similar uh, programmability advantage as the DNA is composed of ATCG and its interactions also relatively predictable compared with the proteins. 
And another one is that the RNA has so like a many like biological functions from the gene regulation to metabolisms. And so I feel like the RNA is like a better molecule so when you want to interact with the biological systems. So this is just a central dogma, right? And the RNA, DNA is more like an information storage materials inside of the cells. And then after the information has been transferred to, let me run this. After the information has been transferred to RNA, and then RNA starts to like, uh, it itself has some function to regulate the transcription or translation process, but it can also uh, translate to proteins, to proteins made of the working horse inside of the cells. And this is the information flow. And then RNA can also regulate this, both the process. The two, two kind of like a major directions for my research is, can we kind of design a better imaging tools with the RNA or DNA to reveal the biological activities of the RNA inside of the cells. And second one is, can we design some like an RNA molecular machine that can to, to put inside of the cells to regulate the, the gene expression? And uh, you know that uh, RNA is, is have some structures, right? And the structure of the RNA has uh, strongly related to its biological function. And uh, if we're able to control the structure of the RNA, and then we can definitely control its function. So th today I want to share with you two stories that basically span my, my PhD and the postdoc. The first one is a recent work that I basically completed during my post postdoc, which is a new imaging methods that allow you to visualize RNA or proteins inside of the cells and tissues. And second one is the sniper, which is ultra-specific gene regulation tools that allow you to identify a single lutein mutations in nerve cells and then to convert it into a protein translation activity. So I will start with the first one. As you know that the uh, fluorescence microscopy is one of the major tools um, that has been used by the um, by lots of people to study the biology. And the fluorescent microscopy, you can uh, visualize where the biomolecules are located. For example, here you can see two chromosome loci, um, the relatively, you know, the positions and orientations. And you can also um, visualize the RNA distributions within the cells and also uh, know the quantities. And uh, for proteins, you can visualize the morphology of the cells, such as the microtubing here are the complex to support the cell morphology. However, Inside of the cells or tissue, there are so many different uh, biological molecules, right? And, uh, and we want to visualize uh, as many as possible. And then in this way, we can collect uh, as much information as possible to understand the biological systems. But the problem is that for the current uh, fluorescence microscopy, you're limited to the fluorophore that you can use and also to detect uh, to, to visualize the uh, biomolecules. This is because we have a kind of like a floor for that for us to use to target the target biomolecules. And then we're also limited by the uh, flow of force uh, to fluorescent signal to collect because we're only to allow to put a few filters to collect the fluorescent signal. And if we put a many and then, you know, there's some like flow for spectrum overlap and it, it will be difficult for us to uh, decode the fluorescent signal when you do the signal processing. And uh, it's also quite uh, challenging that to engineer or synthesize different floor forms that have a, like a sharper or well separated this kind of floor for spectrum because this is limited by the intrinsic properties of the, the electrons, you know, excitation stuff. And um, to address this problem, we're thinking about different angle that can we add another kind of like a dimension to the fluorescence microscopy, which is the temperature. So can we develop a floor force? which can only fluoresce at particular temperature channels and will remain dark at the other temperature channels, which is similar to the laser. And you can just use this particular like a wavelengths of laser to set the floor force. And we want to add the temperature channels and then we can use multiple temperature channels to excite the floor force and then to visualize the biological targets to expand the multiplexity. And how can we achieve that? We look into the DNA because the DNA has a soul well controlled uh, kinetics and thermodynamic behaviors. So we designed the DNA thermal probes and then we'll have the target biomolecules more in the in situ environment and uh, through either a bridge probe or antibody. And then we'll have this kind of thermal probe first bind to the targets and then to form this complex. And this thermal probe will have a quinter and an imager and then they basically first hybridize and then the signal is, is, is repressed. 
And uh, both the Quinter and the, the Sparkle domain have different melting temperatures. And uh, under this, the signal temperature and the signal will be quenched and there's no um, signal. And then if you uh, increase the temperature to, to, its, to the temperature that can excite the fluorescent signal, and then the Quinter will be diffused and then you can uh, see the fluorescent signal that show where the target bound molecule is. And then if you, would, if you want to move the next molecules, and then you can for just uh, increase the, the temperature to next the thermal channel. Um, and then this, the current uh, thermal channel's the signal will be removed. And then this is uh, basically to melt off the imager. And in this way, uh, you can create kind of like a, a thermal channel that allow you to visualize the target bound molecules uh, by exciting the DNA probes the signal at a, a signal temperature. So this is basically the general step. And there's like a, this is similar to the floor for a spectrum. And there's also a kind of like thermal spectrum for the DNA thermal probe. So the DNA thermal pro, the DNA, like a thermal spectrum are basically composed of two parts, right? The first part is the, the, the heating to melt off the quinter. And then in this part, basically the fluorescent signal will increase as you increase the temperature. And then in the second part, and which is a melting of the imager in this way, if you increase the temperature and then the signal will decrease. And the intersection of the two uh, melting profile will give you the thermal spectrums that are for you to visualize the, the target molecules. And, being, and because the DNA is so uh, programmable, and uh, we can basically control the, the binding strength of this uh, two domain to control the thermal spectrum, which means that the thermal spectrum of the DNA thermal probably is uh, highly programmable that uh, you can basically to, to control the width, the, the yield, and all of this. And then we did a, a full like, simulation to across all the temperatures and to identify a good uh, thermal spectrum that can be used for the, for the multiplexed uh, fluorescent imaging in terms of the yield signal temperature and the width of the thermal spectrum. And to have a better DNA thermal probes to do the multiplexed imaging, we want the signal yield to be as high as possible. And also to have more and more thermal channels uh, to do the multiplex imaging, we want the thermal spectrum as narrow as possible. And by, con by considering these two important uh, factors, and then we're able to identify around, like, around five thermal channels, which is good for the experimental validations of the DNA thermal probes. And this is the top. So we will have a microscope, which is generally any kind of a microscope that uh, you have in your lab. And then we have a, like a heating control module, which has a, like a, the slice that you can have the cells or tissues sitting under the, the sitting on, on the uh, cover slice. And then you have a, a temperature control module and to control the, uh, the temperatures. And then you can, this is the uh, temperature profile once you control, uh, like a set of the temperature and then uh, the heating device can basically heat the samples it very, very fastly in just a few seconds, you can reach the desired temperatures to melt off the, the DNA strength in situ. And then you can just uh, let the sample uh, cl cooling down to room temperature, do the bio imaging, and then we, without the, uh, you know, affect the, the imaging process. So this is the, the process. And uh, uh, firstly, we, we were trying to validate uh, uh, this kind of like uh, the thermoplex imaging with uh, uh, RNA uh, fish. So uh, this is just a kind of like a brief uh, introduction of the uh, fish imaging process. So basically you will have the RNA molecules in fixed cells, and then you will have dozens of like a primary probes that are to bind to the RNA. And then this will typically arrange from 20s to, you know, to 70s or even more if you have a, a if you want a, like a stronger signal. And then this probe will typically have a, uh, like a single strand overhand, and then you can have a DNA labeled imager to bind to the uh, fish probe. And then, and then this will give you the kind of like a fish imaging looks like this. And this is uh, the blue region, the nucleus. And then this, this is red dot of the RNA, single RNA molecules located in the cells. And for the thermoplex imaging, the primary probe binding is the same. And then what do we, Simply change it just to uh, replace the imager with the thermal probe and then to have it bind. And then we're going to do the heating and the imaging uh, to see uh, the, whether the signal will show, will show up. And so this is the experimental process. And this uh, is, we designed five different uh, thermal probes uh, with the signal temperature 
uh, across from like uh, 30 degrees to uh, 70 degrees. And uh, as you can see here, we then apply the different heating spike to excite the fluorescent signal. As you can see, only the, the fluorescent probe only shows uh, the, the RNA signal that uh, is assigned temperature channels without uh, showing any signal uh, in its neighbor or other uh, temperature channels. We should, show, we should demonstrate that uh, our designed uh, thermal probes is highly orthogonal that uh, without a signal crosstalk between the different uh, thermal channels. And then this is basically the quantity information of, this, of the RNA expression level at a single cell resolved by all these different thermal probes. As you can see here, the same RNA, the same type of the, the cells, in, this is basically the HeLa cells. They show same level of the RNA expression, which demonstrates that all of the DNA thermal probes will give you the same quantitative information compared with the single molecule feed, single molecule gold standard for the facial imaging. So this uh, shows that the thermal probe won't uh, sacrifice any on the quantitative information of the RNA imaging. And then this uh, is to show that the, the, how fast the signal channel uh, switching is. Because uh, when you do the multiplex imaging previously, you have to apply the DNA imager and then wash it away and then add another imager. And this is uh, one round of this kind of signal exchange is going to take uh, typically half an hour or even more. And with the DNA thermoplex, you can, as you can see here, within basically five seconds, you can basically very fastly to switch the thermal channels. So this is, uh, is data to show that uh, under the signal temperature, this is the thermal probe with the signal temperature at uh, 57 degrees, at 48 degrees is neighbor uh, like thermal channels, no matter how long you heat the sample, there's no signal show up. And then you just need to heat the sample for five seconds and then uh, basically all the signal show up and then it basically already the signal saturated. And then once you move to higher thermal channels, only five seconds, um, the signal is totally removed without, a, you know, without any kind of significant observable signal. Uh, this shows that uh, once you, when you switch it, the different thermal channel is super fast. You don't need to wait tens of minutes or hours, and then you can just do the imaging very fastly. And uh, as we demonstrated that we can, using five thermal channels to visualize the targets and then combine with the three typical flow force that people generally use, uh, and then this can uh, help you to build up like, like a color palette with the 15, like a, like a um, flow, 15, like a color palette for you to do the imaging. And this allow you to visualize basically up to 15 biological targets. And then we firstly apply this 15, we designed 15 orthogonal thermal probes to visualize 15 RNAs in HeLa cells. And this is the three RNAs in the first thermal channels. As you can see here, they, you can clearly visualize also this fluorescent dots represented the target RNA molecules. And this is the three RNAs in three um, four, four channels in the first thermal channels. And this is the three targets in the second thermal channel and third one, fourth one, and the fifth one. So basically all the 15 RNAs can be clearly visualized. Uh, and uh, you can see they're basically distributed uh, in some of the cells. And the next question is, it works very well in, in cells, right? And another very important application for this RNA or this spatial biology area is how good the, the visualization in cells because you, I mean, it, eventually you want to use this to study the, the tissue architectures and the, the different uh, cell types in, in the tissue context. And we also validated the thermal plex in the retina tissue. It is a typical structure in retina tissue. We're trying to target the RNAs, which is the PARCA mRNA located at the interleukin layer of the uh, retina tissue, as you can see here. This is similar to the previous validation that we applied five different thermal probes to visualize this PARCA mRNA in the, in the retina tissue. As you can see here, only the, the probes in its assigned like thermal channels show very strong and clear fluorescent signal. And this is just the main images, as you can see here, the target, the target mRNA is a cell type biomarker, so it won't, repre, won't express at all like cell types only the other particular in, in the in the retinal tissue. So this is basically shows that the thermal probes also works very well in the retinal tissue, in the tissue samples. And then we were trying to have more, include more targets in the retinal tissue to identify different cell types. And then we select 15 molecules, uh, all located at the interleukin layer of the retinal tissue. 
And uh, we basically apply the primary fish flow binding and thermal flow binding in one part, and then do the bioimaging uh, from, from the lower uh, thermal channels into the higher thermal channels. And this is the final images here. And this is the third, three MRI molecules located at the first uh, thermal channels, three floor four channels. And as you can see here, there, there are also markers and they're located at different region of the, this retinal tissue. And the second one, third one, and fourth one, and the fifth one. All of these RNAs can be clearly visualized at the different region of this retinal tissue. And we also did a kind of like a very simple cell type, cell typing using this 15 RNA markers, as you can see here, these are type three bipolar cells and this is type seven bipolar cells. There are around 15 major bipolar cells in the retinal tissue and like two represented cell types. You can tell the different cell types based on this 15 RNA expression pro profile for the at a single cell level. And this is a comparison with a single molecule fish, as you can see here, basically they give you a similar uh, gene expression at uh, each different cell types and uh, to show that it has a, like a, the same, like a quantitative information uh, resolved by the uh, single molecule fish. So this is basically like uh, the RNA imaging. And this principle can also be applied to protein as well. As you can see here, uh, if we just uh, simply uh, switch the, uh, the, the, the DNA primary fish probe to a protein and then have it it's, uh, labeled with the uh, DNA and then you can also do the same thing uh, for the protein imaging. And this is the uh, for, for a preliminary result that we uh, ver verify that uh, it works very well uh, with the tubulin. Uh, as you can see here, um, basically all the uh, tubulin signals show up uh, at the uh, assigned temperatures uh, with those uh, thermal channels. And we also did this, we uh, assigned it five thermal channels or for two floor four channels to visualize up to 10 different uh, protein targets in the, this is, I think the U2OS cells and uh, all of these 10 different uh, proteins can be visualized at the show kind of different uh, positions at a single cell level. And, uh, and this also very fast uh, within a single view of view, which it just uh, take uh, like a few minutes. And, uh, but uh, if you do multiple, multiple rounds of uh, buffer exchange and then uh, which it will typically take hours or even days uh, when you want to visualize up to 15 biological targets. So this is just like an, and the kind of like a, uh, the capability of the DNA thermoplex, thermoplex uh, basically to give you a new capability that to image the biological samples with the heating spike. And uh, it's a super fast. Uh, for you to visualize up to 15 biological targets. And if you include more floor four channels, and then this allow you to visualize probably like a 20. In this kind of middle plex, not that high plex go beyond like a 50 or 100, but in the middle plex around a 20, and then the thermal plex would be an ideal method for you to visualize your target biomolecules. And the next story is about the sniper, which is the which is basically how we can design the RNA molecules that to identify really tiny changes inside the cells and then convert it to the protein expression. I, I think the, the tiny changes inside the cells, which is the mutation, as you know that uh, the genome is composed of four digital letters, A's, T's, and G's. During the cell replication process, and these letters won't always stay the same. It will change a little bit by a little, little bit, and these changes will this the, the mutations. And uh, some of the mutations uh, can be harmful, and uh, some of the mutations can be even beneficial. And uh, most of these mutations, actually, a lot of this method has been done in vitro, but the in vivo, this mutation monitoring is uh, kind of very challenging because it, you know that inside the cells, and uh, there are so many different things, uh, you know, the genome is really big, and also there are some like organelles, uh, proteins floating around. So it's really challenging to identify such as the tiny single nucleotide mutations in, in live cells. But this is actually very important that you have to, you know, the mutation is kind of the driving force for the cell evolution, right? And this is very important as a kind of fundamental biological tools that you can study such tiny changes inside the cells. And we're thinking about, can we design a kind of RNA machineries that to identify these really tiny mutations and then to convert it into a protein expression and the protein expression can be a fluorescent protein that for you to visualize the, the mutation. And it can also even 
be a kind of like a therapeutic protein that to go back to correct the initial mutations as a kind of like a safeguard inside of the cells. And then we designed like a mRNA molecules, which we call sniper single nucleotide specific programmable rubber replicator. So it's essentially an mRNA molecules has a, a the mRNA has the structures to embed its ramson binding site and start codon within a very strong uh, hairpin structures. And in, in this case, the ramson won't have the access to the ramson binding site to start its protein translation. And, and in the absent, in the presence of a perfect binding target, the perfect binding target will bind to this mRNA molecules. And then it will go over a chemical equilibrium to open the, this is hairpin structures to get the ramson binding site exposed. And then the ramson, ramson binding, the ramson can initiate the translation process. And the beautiful point for this design is that uh, we can, we can very uh, precisely program the uh, reaction equilibrium uh, energy between the off state and the on state of this uh, uh, mRNA upon the binding of the target. So through the control of the uh, forward and reverse toe hold embedded in this uh, uh, mRNA molecules. And uh, we can precisely control it to be about a minus one kilo per mole. And in this case, when, uh, when the correct target is present, and then in this case, the on state will be the uh, dominant state uh, because of the Gibbs free energy is, is negative. And then we can, and then if there is kind of mutation occurs on the target, and then it will also go through the chemical equilibrium. But for the on-state, with the binding of the mutant target, there would be a bulge for the on-state. And then this bulge will cause a 4 kicker energy penalty for these structures. And then after it applied to the chemical equilibrium, the reaction energy will become positive 3. And then this will like shift the chemical equilibrium from the, to another direction. So for the perfect binding, which is basically the on-state with the dominant state, but with a mutant target, and then the offset with, with, with is a dominant state because the shift of this uh, chemical equilibrium energy. And then the, the difference directly can reach uh, over 100 fold. So this is the theoretical design uh, schemes that are for us to identify those uh, tiny mutations and convert it into a protein uh, expression in the cells. And uh, as you know, that this uh, process is kind of a little bit uh, uh, complicated and it uh, involves uh, uh, the energy calculation and the uh, uh, RNA structure uh, predictions, and it's uh, difficult to do it by our hands or eyeball. And then we develop a computational design process. We basically have all the structures and reaction energy information encoded in a computer readable script. And then we have the, the computer to design all the sequence, and then we'll go through the, the in situ screening process and to identify the best candidate for the experimental validation. And this is an example to show that all the structure difference upon the binding of the mutant target and perfect, perfect target. As you can see, the structure is dramatically different. And this is the on state uh, for the uh, uh, protein translation, and this is the off state. And uh, this is the experimental validation. With, with the perfect binding target, as you can see here, you can see a uh, first strong RS and the GFP expression. And with the, the mutant target, you can see that there, all the gene expression will be shut, shut off. And the difference is over 100 fold. So this is a remarkable because, you know, that a single nucleotide difference can cause over 100 fold protein expression. So that's a very huge dynamic, uh, dynamic range inside the cells. And we can basically identify all these different types of like mutations, different locations, and even the the mutation causes watson crisp based sparing to wobble based sparing, and uh, we're able to identify um, all of them. And we, since we did a very good job on the base change, we also want to further change the sniper a little bit more by identifying the chemical modifications. We chose two different chemical modifications, the MS6A and the two methylene modifications. MS6A is reported to uh, destabilize the RNA structures, the two methylene modifications is uh, reported to uh, stabilize the RNA structure. So with uh, more and more MS6A, you will see the gene expression decrease. And with uh, more and more MS2 uh, or methane modification, you will see the gene expression increase. So this is basically to show that the sniper is able to dis discriminate a single two or methane modifications uh, within RNA transcript and, and, and two MS6A modifications. 
And this is the design process can be fully automated and, and the people don't need to know about the RNA folding, RNA biology, and the, you just need to give the input of the target and then downstream protein that you want to control. And the computer software basically will generate all the designs for you to the, do the validation. And so this is basically, we tried a, a few clinical relevant limitations. As you can see here, the design sniper is able to differentiate all of them by the fluorescent signal. And we all can also replace the GLP with the enzymes, which can trigger culinary metric reactions. And then we can embed this in a piece of paper. And then you can see here that basically this is the, the sniper embedded in a paper that can differentiate all the clinical relevant mutations. And we also tested that this kind of like a, the paper-based systems with the sniper to identify some like clinical relevant mutation from real like clinical samples, for example, the cancer patient's blood. So this is a collaboration with the Banner Hospital. We collect the breast cancer patient's blood. As you can see here, only the a patient's blood sample will give you the color change. And this is a, the test with the cystic fibrosis tissue samples from the, uh, from the patient. And the, 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 the design sniper embedded on the paper can even distinguish whether it's a homozygous mutation and a heterozygous mutation. And this is the, the, the demonstration that the design sniper embedded in the paper can differentiate three different types of Zika virus strains. And the key feature of the sniper is that it can be used to distinguish really tiny changes in RNA transcript, either base changes or modifications. And there is no sequence limitation theoretically if you're able to do a very good job for the RNA folding prediction. And the downstream proteins can be arbitrary that are for you to encode it for different types of jobs. And so this is just kind of a summary that the first one is the DNA throwplex that are kind of like a imaging tools with the fluorescent microscopy that allow you to visualize lots of up to 15 like a RNA or protein. And then another one sniper that allow you to identify a single leukotide limitations and the modifications. And finally, I want to thank all the people I've been working with. I just started a lab and have three uh, graduate students. And this all my previous uh, advisors uh, in my post in my postdoc and in my PhD and all the uh, people I've been working with. And uh, thank you for all your attention. And uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Fantastic! Thank you so much. That was really inspiring. And you know, yeah. part of the which is like definitely the type of stuff that I think our group uh, really loves. If you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to raise your hand or put your questions in the chat. Uh, yeah, I think Ted already mentioned in the chat, really excellent work. Totally agree. Absolutely. So in case anyone has questions, please raise your hand. In the meantime, I'll maybe kick us off with, you know, a question that we also asked you via email and it will, oh, here we have one. Okay. You can best shut me up by raising your hand. And we have two folks already that did that. So perhaps we start with Ed first uh, and then, oh my God, we have three people in the queue right now. But go ahead. Hi. Uh -huh. Nice talk. I yeah. yeah. Uh, my question pertains to your first part of your presentation. For that, are you able to say fluctuate the temperature such that you can yeah. get it to blink, like DNA paint or the washings that will prevent you from doing this? The, you mean the DNA paint? Yes. Can you fluctuate the temperature from low to high near uh, your Pretty to easily. Get it just, blink? Actually, you can just shift the temperature from low to high, but once you come back, because all the Probes have already melted off. They are diffusing, di already like diffusing into the into the buffer. And once you go back, and then the signal won't be recovered. And now, so you like add new probes to bind it, then do the image again. So it's basically uh, you can just go up and it cannot go down. So that's current like a limitation. Actually, we're thinking about like a design a reversible process that uh, once you know once you move to a high temperature and then come further back. But that's kind of the next plan. But currently, we can just one direction. Yeah. Oh, cool. Look forward to your next work then. Yeah. Uh, question. Great talk. Regarding also the first project, have you looked into the sensitivity of your method? Like how many transcripts per what concentration are you able to do? I think for for RNA imaging, theoretically, this, uh, this method allows you to image in single RNA copies inside of the cells. Because, uh, you know, uh, if you go back, let, let me go back uh, to the original slides. If you see this data, 
So this does is directly their our single RNA. So basically the, the RNA image in the fish a method can give you the single uh, copy sensitivity. But definitely you also need to consider, you know, there's some like a background noisy. Theoretically, it can give you like a single molecule of the RNA imaging. Yeah. Wait. And if, for proteins, it's more, be more challenging because the YouTube protein, if you don't do any amplification, protein is more, more those, for example, the tubulin, the, 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 the protein will more localized, right? And then that'll give you, for protein, probably it's hard to add to tell the sensitivity, but we can always do some image amplification that to boost the signal and then for you to visualize a, a low abundant expressed proteins. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Next one, we have Paratosh. Hey, Fan Hong. Thank you so much for your presentation. I have a question around the first part. Did you model the temperature response and any reason for why it's a step up and step down response? Yeah, that was my question. Model the temperature, this, let's see, this part. Yeah. And also in the later slides, you have showcased that even with a slight modification from the 57 temperature to 63, like there is absolutely no response. So what was, you know, like the model of like temperature response according to you? And yeah. The matter to model this like an in-situ melting process. Exactly. Uh, uh, it's basically from Santa Lucia's big model. You can calculate the enthalpy and the entropy, and then you can calculate the binding strength based on the Santa Lucia's model. There's some already measured parameters by, by kind of like old and also classic papers. And uh, I think that the, the general, this uh, thermodynamic modeling is all based on Santa Lucia nearest neighbor model. Or to, to study the stability of the DNA hybridization or RNA hybridization. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Next one, we have Tad. Oh, hi, Fan. I'm, I'm Tad Hogue. I enjoyed your presentation. Oh. So my question goes toward the second part of your presentation. We you talked about designing molecules, which I thought was particularly interesting. When you mentioned part of the motivation about molecular machines, and so I was wondering whether this design approach can also design mechanical properties of the RNA structures, like people do with DNA origami, to, if, to meet some kind of engineering structural requirements, such say as stiffness or bending in specific dire directions or being able to transmit forces to different parts of a cell you know, without it buckling or various kind of mechanical properties like, you know, like that. I think there, there are indeed a... I think several groups are working on the DNA based device that to introduce a force for the to sell uh, kind of like a like a set of activities. For example, you can design some DNA origami this uh, like a clamp to 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 um, to induce some force for this some membrane. And also there are another several groups that design kind of DNA tension probes that allow you to make the, the cell mechanical force once there is some like a signal. There's some like a stimuli applied to the cell and the, the, the cell membrane will come shrink and then they will apply some like a force to, to, for the DNA probes for, it, for you to see the macular force of the cells. But uh, I haven't seen any kind of, inside of the cell, I mean, design the RNA uh, structures inside the cell to, to have this kind of, kind of mechanical, you know, to study these mechanical properties inside the cells. I think that's a quite a, Challenging. First one, the design, and the second one is the, is the measurement. That's the kind of the two challenges. The first challenge is that uh, how can you control this uh, the folding? Sharpin probably is a, can have some mechanical force, but uh, if you want to apply a higher force, and then you have to implement some origami technique, and this uh, will in, involve some complicated folding uh, of the RNA. And uh, this complicated folding is generally difficult for isothermal uh, self-assembly. And the second challenge is the measurement that how can you to measure this kind of like a mechanical force. And uh, I haven't seen people done that in vivo, but there's definitely something with the DNA origami based approach in vitro as the interface of the cells with, with this problem, definitely, yeah. Yeah, I think it gets a lot harder when you try to think of doing these things inside cells. It's a much more complicated and Yeah, yeah exactly, and, yeah, and exactly. Curious. Yeah, and I think that there's some another thing I'm I'm also think a little bit is that uh, you know there's some like a biochemistry inside of the cells and different density they have different kind of like a uh, I think probably by uh, uh, like a cliff at Princeton 
they can introduce some like a tension, you know, just like similar to the oil droplet on surface, there have some shrinking. And then there's also some similar phenomenon inside the cells, but it's not a, it's not a with the pure RNA, they're, they're able to give us some like a bioconcept inside the cell to marry those tension. That's that, that's it. And some like a new work coming out uh, probably uh, late last year. Yeah. That's okay, it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much. Am I missing anyone? Anyone, questions, comments, please feel free to still raise your hand or if you can't unmute, then just drop them in the chat and then I, I will, I'm happy to funnel them. I'll maybe wait here for a second. Okay. Please feel free to keep them coming if you think of more. But one thing that we often ask our speakers and we did ask you as well by email before the presentation is like, if there is, you know, Perhaps, and I think you touched on a few of them already, but if there's a, a specific challenge where you like, if someone new is entering the field, I would really want this specific piece solved. Uh, that would really make my life much easier and would uh, really accelerate progress in the field. Is there something that you could put your finger on um, that you may want to draw uh, people's attention to? So you mean the challenge for, so I didn't get that question. Yeah. It's basically, it's better to do similar to the questions that we also send you by emails. Basically just, if someone new was entering your field, and they're like, I really want to help make progress. What would you say is currently like an undervalued area for progress that people could be focusing on? I think like from my PhD, I more grow, grow up in a kind of like a molecular machine group that uh, from my uh, PhD and also my postdoc basically were really enjoying design molecules to, to you know, do different type of jobs. But I think one particular challenge uh, I think currently, also my group currently trying to push forward is that how can you design those molecules? We basically work with those biomolecules. How can you interface those design biomolecules with the uh, biological environment, you know, to implement those rational design rules that really to interact with those biomolecular machineries? I think that's not I really like the work, not because it's done by me. It's really that we give an example that we can implement the, this strand displacement, competitive strand displacement. To, re, to identify really tiny changes inside the cells and then make the cells do those kind of like a translation, control the translation. We basically develop this kind of like a molecular machine that embed within the cellular, complicated cellular machineries. So I think that's the challenge is that how far that we can push it forward because you know that the cell has so many fantastic examples of those complicated machineries. And currently people have you know, resolve those, resolve the, those structures. I think when I joined, started my PhD, my, my PhD advisor, Hao Yan, showed me the structures of the Ramazon that can we design those kind of like a complicated machine uh, in the future, design such kind of uh, Ramazon uh, in the future and uh, to make it do their work. And uh, I think that's kind of like the, the challenge I want to pursue in the future. Yeah. Yeah, love it. And I think that's also not the first comparison that we have had in the group here. So that's awesome. There's still more people wanting to join <laughs> to see your talk. <laughs> maybe, you know, I guess maybe we'll have time for two more, but let me just ask you perhaps already to get that one out of the way. If people are excited about your work, which uh, I think you can tell they are from the chat, what is something that, you know, you, you guys need help with? Are there any, for example, upcoming papers that you guys are working on? you know, where, I don't know, someone could, could be collaborating on, or is there anything specific that your lab is trying to do in the near future that people in this group, or maybe people watching this afterwards on YouTube can help you with? So currently, current, there are two major di directions. The first direction is that uh, we want to scale up our imaging cap capability of this DNA-based methods to more spatial trans transcriptomics and proteomics uh, that to firstly, to understand the biological systems. And I always uh, will kind of want to go to track the first one. If you want to design those biomolecular machines that operate inside of the biological system, that for example, cells, you first have to understand how cell works. So I think that, you know, any kind of tools that allow us to understand more about biology, that will be helpful for us to design those biomolecular machines in the future. And second track is that after we learn those biological rules, that how can we implement those biological rules to design this biomolecular machines, for example, the RNA machines to make them to do the things we want them to do inside the cells. Yeah. So that's like a two major directions. And, and yeah, this, I think there are definitely lots of opportunities in the future for, you know, for this community that to discuss. Cool. 
Last question. Let's see how far we get into it. It's a big one. If you guys are successful, where do you think this research could be in like about five years? You know, if you think about possible applications down the line, you know, in a more speculative mode, perhaps, uh, what do you think is a possible uh, opportunity to really like make a difference in the world? I think there are two major like downstream applications. The first one is for the for the RNA design, RNA based this machineries. One one example is that uh, uh, like RNA therapeutics, right? And imagine that I think the mRNA drug, the COVID vaccine, has shown a very great example that we can design those mRNA molecules and put it inside in the cells, and then you know to fight against the virus. And I think in the future. I believe that we can definitely design much better those RNA therapeutics and the people also develop those self-amplifying those RNA drugs. And, and, th- and can we design a better precise RNA drug that to, you know, put it inside this, our body and then it can particularly kill the cancer cells without affecting other cells. And I believe that in future we can achieve this because we understand more about the RNA biology and have a, like a, better controllability of the RNA folding and also the higher accuracy prediction power of the RNA structures. And if we have all of these parts mature and definitely in the future, I believe that we can uh, design some like uh, RNA drugs that uh, can precisely kill those, uh, you know, bad cells that we want them. And another part is uh, about the pre-diagnostics. Uh, currently, the diagnostic sometimes will cannot distinguish the bad uh, uh, for example, cancer cells or cancer uh, tissues and uh, normal tissue, because in the early stage, these two parts are not that clear. And uh, with the imaging or the capabilities, we, after we were able to resolve, you know, hundreds or even thousands of those molecules to collect those really high dimensional information. And then we can tell those really tiny difference between from the very, very beginning of those cancer cells or cancer colonization in the tissue. So that's a uh, that's like an example of the two downstream applications. Yeah. Love it. Thank you so much. This was absolutely fantastic. I'm really excited about this work. Thanks everyone for your great questions. Thanks for staying a minute over. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and I hope it's not the last time that we see you for a seminar here. Thanks everyone. Have a good one. Thanks a lot for joining.